Good evening and welcome to our program. This series is focusing on This Is Your FBI. This Is Your FBI was a radio crime drama which aired in the United States on ABC from April 6, 1945 to January 30th, 1953 for a total of 409 shows. The show featured true cases from the FBI and was told from an FBI agent's viewpoint. FBI Chief J. Edgar Hoover gave it his endorsement, calling it our show and calling it the finest dramatic program on the air. Generally, I do not include advisories. Given Hoover's polarizing nature, I will share this. Dramatized stories created for propaganda purposes are not history. They tell one biased side of the story, and in no way am I saying that these are reliable stories. I just believe them to be interesting when viewed through the scope of entertainment and weird history. Finally, I'd like to send a specific thank you to publicdomainreview.org and archive.org for organizing and compiling all of this media. If you would like to listen to standalone media, we have included a link in the description. The Equitable Life Assurance Society presents This is Your FBI. This is your FBI, the official broadcast from the files of the Federal Bureau of Investigation, presented as a public service by the Equitable Life Assurance Society of the United States and the Equitable Society's representative in your community. Are you this kind of a person? You go on a summer vacation only to discover that all your worries have gone right along with you. If that's a true picture of you, then we of the Equitable Life Assurance Society would like to make a very simple suggestion. See your Equitable Society representative without delay. Ask him to fix you up with a lifelong vacation from worries about your family's financial future. Tell him you want the complete peace of mind that comes from a well-planned life insurance program with the Equitable Life Assurance Society of the United States. Tonight's FBI file, The Benevolent Hijacker. Throughout the nation, in every corner of every state, wherever there's a patch of sand and a body of water or a cluster of trees, citizens who have worked hard all year are taking their well-earned vacations. For this short period, they are in temporary retirement from their places of business. But in at least one field of endeavor, there is no holiday season, no vacation period when work is forgotten. And that field is crime. The criminal is busy stealing, cheating, killing 52 weeks a year. And that is why every law enforcement agency, like your FBI, is at work every day and every night. Only in that way can any progress be made against the crime wave and against the army of criminals. Tonight's FBI file opens in an apartment in a smart residential section of a large eastern city. A young man is sitting in the living room of this suite. He gazes admiringly at the oil paintings that line the wall. A door opens and a middle-aged man enters. Hiya, Bob. Oh, hello there, Uncle Ed. Oh, I'm sorry to keep you waiting, kid. Oh, that's all right. Uh, just a second, I'll take a look at my mail here. Oh, surely. Uh, I was just admiring your apartment. Oh, yeah, that's right. You've never been to this one, have you? No. It's not a bad scatter. I like your taste in paintings. Oh, I have a guy who buys them for me. Oldies, you know. Oh, that one there isn't old. Hmm? Old the girl? Yeah. She's lovely. Who is she? (laughs) A very personal friend, kid. (laughs) Lay off. Okay, I'm sorry. (laughs) Well, let's hear about you. I haven't seen you for a few weeks. Oh, I'm getting along all right, Uncle Ed. How long is it now since you graduated? A little over two months. How do you like working for me? Just fine. Are you sure that doing all kinds of little odd jobs isn't beneath your dignity as a college man? Oh, of course not. Well, you know, this isn't what I had in mind for you, kid, when I sent you through school. Uncle Ed, I like the work. And what's more, I want to stay in it. Well, now, that's what I was hoping you'd say. Uh, what have the reports on me been? Oh, 
Oh, oh, okay, okay. In fact, uh, that's why I sent for you today. I've got you lined up for a promotion. Hey, that's wonderful. What is it? I'm sending you out tomorrow night with two other boys to hijack a truck. Pardon me. What? This is Mr. Shelby's car, isn't it? Oh, yes. He called for it. He didn't. I did. I'm Miss Jackson. Yes, I recognized you. Have we met? Well, no, but I've seen your portrait in my uncle's living room. Oh, you're Ed's nephew, Bob Norwood. <laughs> That's right. I've heard an awful lot about you. It's nice to see you. It's nice to see you, Miss Jackson. Uh, can I drive you someplace? Where's your uncle's chauffeur? Oh, you went to the ball game. I told him I'd stand by and take any calls. Now, where to, Miss Jackson? I'd like to go to my hairdresser. All right, hop in. Thanks. Where is your hairdresser? 12th and Main. You know, I've seen you before. Really? Where? Well, I... Your uncle took me to a football game last fall. I saw you play. <laughs> and you still talk to me? You went bad. <laughs> uh, you got the numbers mixed. This is kind of a switch for you, isn't it? What do you mean? Working for your uncle. Maybe, but I like it fine. How long have you been with him? Almost eight months. He says you're doing a real good job. He hey, says... Look, do me a favor, huh? What? Well, I'm a very dull topic. Let's talk about you. That would be really dull. Not to me. Look, I've got an idea. Why don't you skip the hairdresser? Oh, but I have an appointment. Well, cancel it. It's a beautiful day. Let's head for the country. What do you say? Well, I... Come on. Okay. In another section of the city at an FBI field office, Special Agent Jim Taylor is just approaching a fellow agent's desk. Oh, Carl. Yes, Jim. Have you talked to Mr. Price? Yes, just a few minutes ago. He told me that we've both been assigned to the same case. That's right. I've already been out doing some preliminary work on it. I just left police headquarters. Well, suppose you fill me in, Jim. Okay. Well, as you know, a truck was hijacked early this morning. Yes? It was traveling interstate. That's what brought us into the case. And uh, where was this? Out on Route 17. Two men slugged the driver just as he left an all-night diner. They took his keys and drove the truck away. Was the driver badly hurt? Yeah, he's in the hospital. Could he identify either of the men? Well, no one has talked to him, Carl. He's still unconscious. Mm. Well, are there any clues on the thing at all, Jim? No, not a one. I'm hoping the driver can help us when he comes to. Uh, what were you doing at police headquarters? Oh, they reported the case to us and asked me to drop over there. Oh, I see. They've been trying to solve a series of hijackings that have happened in the past few months. They were local jobs, but the pattern of operation is exactly the same as the one employed in the case that we're working on. Sounds like the work of a professional gang. Yeah, I can't. I would say it does. Now, oh, incidentally, in one of the cases the police are working on, the truck driver was killed. Well. So we'll work right along with the police on this thing. Well, that should be a help. Uh, Jim, what's our next procedure on this case? Well, I think we should go over to the hospital to check on that injured driver if he's well enough to talk. Hello, darling. Hello, Laura. Sorry I'm late. <laughs> Honey, it's not the first time. Where are we going, Bob? Oh, someplace I thought up all by myself. Like where? Around the park in that handsome cab. Wonderful. <laughs> Come on. Okay. Haven't done this in years. Oh, you don't know what you've missed. Well, there's your other customer, driver. Shall we just hop in? Right. Here, let me help you in, honey. Give me your hand. All right. <laughs> there you go. <laughs> there we are. Okay, driver, let's go. Go, Nelly. Well, how is it? Pretty collegiate, but I like it. <laughs> Good. And no one will see us. Are you still worried about that? You should be, too. Don't forget, honey. He's your uncle. I know. He put me through college, gave me my start, and I should be properly grateful. You should. Bob, there's one thing that's always puzzled me. What? After spending all that time on a college education, why did you turn to larceny? Well, doesn't being smart help? Sure. But there's so many other things you could have done. Oh, they take too long. I want a quick money business. That's why I work for Uncle Ed. Honey, do you realize that if I maneuver correctly, I can have enough money to retire at 30? Is that all you want? That and one other thing. What? You. 
sorry, honey. I'm not available. Well, now, wait a minute. Why have you dated me so much these past three months? Because I liked you. So? Why aren't you available? Your Uncle Ed's been very nice to me, Bob. Well, I could be just as nice. Not as long as you just work for Uncle Ed. Oh. So, honey boy, let's forget about us. Till you get to be 30. Oh, Carl. Yes, Jim. The police have found the truck. The one that was hijacked? Mm -hmm. Where was it? At the bottom of the river. What? Yeah, I'll give you the whole story, Carl. A patrolman saw a man drive a truck off the end of a pier early this morning. Yeah. I couldn't save the truck, but he did arrest the driver and he notified headquarters. So a diving crew went on the job. I see. Their description of the truck proved it to be the same one that was hijacked. Have you questioned the driver? Yes, but he wouldn't talk. The police are still grilling him. And does he look important? No, I'd say he was just a stooge who'd been ordered to get rid of the truck. Oh, incidentally, none of the trucks ever turned up in any of the previous hijackings. This must be the way they disposed of them. Yes. And Carl, there's another factor in this. What's that? This was a white truck. Now, that's pretty conspicuous. I don't think they would have dared to have driven it very far before getting rid of it. Mm, that's true. Now, there's a warehouse district near there. I think we should get a map, section it off, and do a systematic check of all warehouses in that vicinity. Did someone just come in? It's me, Uncle Ed. Bob. Oh. Where have you been, Bob? Why? I've been looking all over for you. What for? Well, we got trouble. One of our drivers was picked up. Oh, what happened? Well, he was getting rid of that last truck. A cop saw him. They got him at headquarters now. Which driver? Willie. Well, he's pretty solid. Yeah, uh, they're all solid till the pressure's on. You think he'll talk? I don't know. I don't know. But I can't take any chances. Well, that's true. What are you going to do? I'll get over to the warehouse and move the stuff out. Take it to our west side building. Then if he does blow a whistle, the cops won't find a thing. Uncle Ed. Hmm? If you don't mind my saying so, that's not the way I'd do it. No? Well, what's your idea? Well, I'd move this stuff and then get out of town. Stay away until you're sure that nothing can happen to you. Well, what would I do with the business? Well, you've been giving me a pretty thorough training. You mean, let you run it? Well, just till you get back. No. No, that don't sound right, kid. Don't you trust me? Oh, that ain't the point. That ain't the point. I don't like walking out on things. I've been in tougher spots than this. Well, then you're going to do it your way and go to the warehouse? Yes. Yes, I'm getting over there right now. Just a minute. Hello, honey. Bob, what are you doing here? Paying a social call. Darling, I told you never to come here. And I told you I was sick of meeting you on back streets and in handsome cabs. Well, aren't you going to ask me in? Okay, just this once. Thanks. Well, this place really fits you. What do you mean? Hmm, duplex living room. White leather chairs, very plushy. <sighs> I'm glad you approve. Well, now, what kind of a hostess are you, anyway? What about a drink? Okay. But, Bob, I'm going to warn you now. You can't stay long. Why not? Your Uncle Ed is due here at 8 o'clock. Honey, I don't think he'll show up. Why? Oh, he's got trouble. One of his drivers was picked up by the police. He's being questioned now. Oh, that's bad. What's Ed going to do? Well, I tried to advise him to go away. Go away? Just temporarily, till the trouble was over. Wait a minute. That isn't what you had in mind. What do you mean? You try to get him to go away so you could take over. <laughs> Darling, you're psychic. I bet it didn't work. No, truthfully, it didn't. But I think I win anyway. How? Well, he went to the warehouse near where the driver was picked up. He intended to move out the stuff that was in there. So? So, I called the police and told them that he was there. Oh. That shocks you? Yes. Well, I was just following Uncle Ed's advice. He's told me right along that if you want anything badly enough, you take it any way you can get it. Now, I have you. We will return in just a moment to tonight's case from the files of your FBI. Don... Do you think you'd know a professional worry lifter if you saw one? 
Did you say professional worry lifter? That's right. And when old man worry is darkening your life, a professional worry lifter is a mighty good man to know. You'll get more from him than sympathy and good advice. You'll find he actually does something about throwing old man worry for a loss. Okay, lead me to it. Well, he's never hard to find. He's your equitable society representative. If you have fears about your family's future, your equitable society representative is always ready to pitch in and do a thoroughgoing job of worry lifting, which will even include readjustment income. What kind of income is that? The Equitable Society's Readjustment Income Plan provides extra income for the widow during the two toughest years, the two years immediately following her husband's death, years in which she is adjusting the family way of life to a lowered income. You know, expenses can't be reduced overnight. It takes time. And that's why every life insurance program should provide readjustment income for extra help during the two toughest years. You know, you may have something there. Does this readjustment income run into a lot of money? Why, it may not cost you a cent. It may require only a simple rearranging of your present life insurance program. In any event, the man to see is your professional worry lifter, your equitable society representative. Look in the phone book for the Equitable Life Assurance Society. That's E-Q-U-I-T-A-B-L-E. Or send a postcard care of this station to the Equitable Life Assurance Society of the United States. Now back to the FBI file, The Benevolent Hijacker. Sociologists have been making studies of the criminal for many years in a sincere effort to find out what makes one man a criminal and allows another man to become a respected member of the community. As yet, they have not arrived at the final and conclusive answer to that question. It has been shown that environment is very important, and yet bank presidents have come from the slums. It has also been shown that a lack of education was at least partially responsible for some men turning to crime. And yet, as can be seen from tonight's case from the files of your FBI, formal education is not the complete answer either. This man, with the benefits of a college education and an unlimited allowance, still turned to crime and ended by betraying his benefactor. Tonight's file continues at the FBI field office. Special Agent Jim Taylor is seated at his desk. Uh, Jim, I didn't think you'd still be here. Well, I've been waiting for you, Carl. You're not having dinner. Something developed in the hijacking? Yes. The head man has been arrested. Well, I seem to miss out on everything. How did this happen? An anonymous phone call was received at police headquarters late this afternoon. They were given an address down on River Street. Told to go there and pick up the man responsible for the recent hijackings as well as a goodly portion of the loot. And the tip really paid off? That's right. Well, that was a break. Who is this man? Well, his name is Ed Shelby. He has a long criminal record. And where is he now? Well, the police have booked him. He's in city jail. Did he admit to the hijacking? No, no, he wouldn't talk. But he doesn't have to. There's sufficient evidence in the warehouse to indict him, and the place was leased in his name. Mm. There must have been a number of men employed in his operation. Were any of them picked up? Two of them. I believe the police are trying to get a line on the others now. How about our jurisdiction on this? Hmm? Will he be liable to federal prosecution? Oh, the DA will work that out with the United States attorney. But I have a feeling the state will try him first. Why? Well, there's a murder charge against him from one of those early hijackings, remember? Oh, yes, of course. Well, Carl, now that this one is over, I think we ought to get to work and write up our report. Bob. Yes, Laura? What are you doing? Just making a few notes. About what? Procedure. What? How I'm going to handle things now that I'm in charge. Oh. One question, hmm? What? What's there left for you to be in charge of? Are you kidding? No. Police have knocked off Ed in the warehouse, and they undoubtedly picked up some of the boys. I've taken all that into consideration. There's still plenty left. Like what? Well, like the second warehouse over on the west side. It's full of loot. There'll be enough boys who weren't picked up to keep us in business. Do you think they'll work for you? Yes. Just because you're Ed's nephew? No, because I'm moving in fast. Uncle Ed always said that's what you should do if you want to take over. Oh. And that's just how I'm going to work, honey. I'm going to round up the boys now. I'll see you later.
Special Agent Taylor. Hello, Jim. This is Carl Spencer. Oh, yes, Carl. I'm down at police headquarters. For once, I'm getting a chance to give you some news. Oh, what is it? Ed Shelby's broken out of jail. What? When was this? About an hour ago. How did it happen? He asked for permission to see the prison doctor. Mm-hmm. He was allowed to go to the doctor's office unescorted. En route there, he shinnied up a pipe to a window about ten feet up, unlocked it, and jumped out. Well, just like the Raymond Street jailbreak in New York last winter. Yes. Any trace of him? No. He just disappeared. Hmm. I assume the police have already sent out an alarm. Yes, they have. Have they knowledge of where he lived, who his friends were, Carl? I have his address, Jim. They're working on who his friends were now. No. Where does he live? An apartment house on Maple Road. You got the number? 728. 728 Maple Road. That's right. Police been over there? Yeah. So far, he hasn't shown up. Oh, I don't imagine he will. Not there. But I think we should search the place, Carl. Might give us some lead on where he could be found. I'll pick up a search warrant and meet you over there. <laughs> Just a minute. Hello, honey. Oh, come in, Bob. Thanks. Well, everything worked fine. Really? Mm-hmm. Make me a drink, honey, and I'll tell you all about it. Sure. You know, I owe a great deal of thanks to Uncle Ed. How's that? Oh, he taught me well. I used his technique today, and it worked like a charm. His boys were delighted to come over with me. Do you want soda? Please. Here you are. Thanks. Aren't you drinking? Not right now. No. A toast to Uncle Ed. Thanks, kid. What? Thanks for the toast. Uncle Ed. (laughs) What are you doing here? Oh, Lara's an old friend of mine. I mean, I thought you were in jail. I was. How did you get out? Busted out. Oh. Well, congratulations. Stop the con, kid. I know everything that's happened. What do you mean? I've just been having a nice long talk with Lara. She gave me the full rundown. Lara, you told her? Yes. You see, kid, there's a couple of lessons I didn't give you. The first one is... Never trust a dame. They always play the winner. I see what you mean. The second one is even more important. Don't ever double-cross anyone. Especially your uncle. Look, Uncle Ed... Don't try any tricks, kid. I've got a gun right here. And you know I'm the guy who can use it. Yeah. Okay, but... What happens now? Well, to tell you the truth, I really came here on business... Finding out about you just happened on the side. What kind of business? I've got to blow town. I need money. Lara, you're getting it for me. How? There's plenty of cash in that safe deposit box. Either one of us can sign for it, remember? Yes. I want you to go over there and empty it. I'll call one of the boys to escort you there and back, just to keep you in line. In the living room, Carl. Oh. I just went through all Shelby's bedroom. Oh? You find anything that might be a lead? No, nothing. He's a pretty smart operator. I just looked all through his desk, and there's no personal papers in it at all. How about an address book? No. No sign of one. I called the police headquarters while I was in the bedroom. No? Any developments? No. They've been working on Shelby's personal life. They learned that he had a nephew who worked for him. Oh, they think this nephew might be hiding him out? Not at his own place. He lives in a hotel room. Police went to his hotel. He was out. I see. I also learned that Shelby has a girl. Huh? Who is she? Where does she live? And I haven't found that out yet. Well, that could be a very important lead, Carl. It'd be very logical for him to seek shelter with her. Yeah. Well, there should be something around here to tell us no, something. No, I... Hey, wait a minute. What? Huh. Look, this is just a wild stab, Carl, but take a look at all those paintings on the living room wall. Yeah? Well, only one of them looks contemporary. There, that one. Portrait of that girl. See? Oh, that's right. Say, it's just barely possible. I know. That's what I'm thinking, Carl. Look, there's the artist's signature in the right-hand corner. Let's get in touch with him at once. Wait a minute. Where are you going, kid? Wanted to get a cigarette. Oh. Well, remember, I still have the gun. 
I know. Go ahead. Throw me one, too. Here. Thanks. You know something, Bob? You're not a bad kid. You just made your move at the wrong time. I'm glad you're that understanding. Why shouldn't I be? After all, you are my own flesh and blood. What happens when Laura comes back? Oh, I take the money and blow. Where to? South America. Do you think you'll get that far? (laughs) Sure, why not? Well, after all, you broke out of jail. Every cop in town will be looking for you. I can handle that. Do you plan to take Laura with you? (laughs) What for? In South America, dames like her grow in bunches, on trees. They're going to leave her for me, then? Well, not exactly. You see, kid, you're not going to be around. Oh. So that's it. Mm Mm-hmm. A present from my uncle. Oh, I, uh... I wouldn't kill you myself, kid. I, I couldn't. It's like I told you. You're my own flesh and blood. Yeah, I know, I know. I got a much cleaner way all figured out. Like what? I'll, uh, I'll let Lara do it. She wouldn't. You couldn't make her. Oh, yes, I can. I'll hold the gun. She'll pull the trigger. There she is. Stay right where you are. She's got her key. Lara? Yes, Ed? Well, how'd you make out? Okay, I cleaned out the box. Well, come on in, come on in, close the door. You can't, Shelby. Huh? I'll take that gun. Let go. Bradman. Got it, Jim? Yeah. Yeah. All right, Carl, call the police. Tell them we have the fugitive. Ed Shelby was turned over to state authorities, convicted and sentenced to be executed for murder. His nephew, Bob, was convicted in the federal court for theft from an interstate shipment and sentenced to 20 years. For her complicity, Laura Jackson was convicted on the same charges and sentenced to five years in a federal penitentiary. Tonight's case was brought to a successful close because a special agent of your FBI was able to recognize that one portrait in a room full of paintings was a recent work. A visit to the painter produced the address of the subject, and there, as you have seen, the arrests were made. Arrests which led to removal of these criminals to a place where they could no longer be a menace to the safety of you or any other American citizen. In just a moment, we will tell you about next week's exciting case from the files of your FBI. Mr. Keating, Mary has been a mighty good wife to me. I've been thinking that the least I could do would be to fix her up with one of those equitable society readjustment income plans you were telling us about. Right, Don. One of the finest things any husband can do for his wife is to provide her with that extra income during the two tough years. She might need that extra cash to give her time to adjust her expenses to a new standard of living. I won't even tell her about it until I can show it to her in black and white. That'll be a grand surprise, Don. Get in touch with your Equitable Society representative without delay. Let him show you how little it costs to provide your wife with equitable readjustment income. Call your Equitable representative soon. Or send a postcard care of this station to the Equitable Life Assurance Society of the United States. Next week, we will bring you another colorful story from the files of the Federal Bureau of Investigation, The Uninvited Partner. The incidents used in tonight's Equitable Life Assurance Society's broadcast are adapted from the files of the Federal Bureau of Investigation. However, all names used are fictitious. And any similarity thereof to the names of persons living or dead is accidental. Tonight, the music was composed and conducted by Frederick Steiner. Your narrator was Dean Carlton, and Special Agent Taylor was played by Stacey Harris. This is Your FBI is a Jerry Devine production. This is Larry Keating speaking for the Equitable Life Assurance Society of the United States and the Equitable Society's representative in your community and inviting you to tune in again next week at this same time when the Equitable Life Assurance Society will bring you another thrilling story from the files of the Federal Bureau of Investigation. The uninvited partner on This Is Your FBI. This is ABC, the American Broadcasting Company.
The Equitable Life Assurance Society presents This is Your FBI. This is Your FBI, the official broadcast from the files of the Federal Bureau of Investigation. Presented as a public service by the Equitable Life Assurance Society of the United States and the Equitable Society's representative in your community. A tour, a cruise, the mountains or the shore, wherever you are this summer, if you are one of the 12 million policyholders and beneficiaries who own or will benefit by Equitable Society life insurance policies, we like to think that your vacation is especially pleasant. Your Equitable Society policy safeguards you against uncertainty and insecurity. Yes, to enjoy a completely carefree vacation, make sure you have all the life insurance protection you need. See your Equitable Society representative soon. Tonight's FBI file, The Uninvited Partner. Our civilization is the most advanced in the long history of the world. We who are alive today enjoy advantages of living undreamed of generations ago. And yet, with all of our refinements, if you can pay for it, you can still rent a human being to commit murder. These professional killers have no single base of operations. And they murder not because they hate but because it's their business. They care not why they kill, nor in most cases whom they kill, just so long as they remain employed. Tonight's FBI file opens in an apartment hotel located in one of the better residential districts of a large western city. A young lady who lives in one of the suites in this building is just entering her front door. Well? Yes, Walter. Did you go to the lawyers? Well, of course I told you I would. What's the story? They want to have the marriage annulled. For how much? Ten thousand. Not enough. Walter, that isn't bad. Honey, what do you think you're playing, Jax? Well, it's better When than... the Conway family is very rich. If they want to have your marriage to their pride and joy annulled, they've got to up that figure. Plenty. Walter, don't forget, we did frame the guy into marrying me. That's not true. Oh, stop. They got him so drunk he'd have married you if you asked him. Very funny. Well, what do I tell the lawyer? About the money? Yes. Tell him it's not acceptable. He said that was their final offer. Forget what he said. I've got other ideas. Oh. Where is your husband now? On a hunting trip. Where? At his camp. Have you ever been there? Yeah. Why? Do you know the way up there well enough to direct somebody to the place? Oh, sure. Look, what is this? We're not going to take the 10000 Hmm? And we're not going to have your marriage to Mr. Conway annulled. We're not? No. I know how you can get all of Mr. Conway's money. How? Oh. It's very simple. Instead of being his wife, you become his widow. Answer the door, will you, Gwen? Okay. Just a minute. Hello. Hello. Is Walter Hughes here? Oh, are you Russ Moody? That's right. Come in, please. Hello there, Russ. Hello, Walter. Uh, this is Miss Blair, Mr. Moody. How do you do? Hello. Well, it certainly has been a long time, huh? Yeah. You haven't changed a bit, Russ. You look fine, fine. Walter, uh, let's get down to business. Oh, oh, sure, sure. I've got a job for you. I can use one. The horse has been running bad? 
They've been running fine, but too slow. Uh, can I make you fellas a scotch? A swell, a scotch and soda for me, honey. Yeah, I'll have the same. Okay. What's your deal, Walter? I've got a client. I can't tell you his name. He wants to have a certain party disposed of. For how much? One thousand in cash. Where did you come up with that kind of a client? Russ, I don't ask you anything about your business, do I? Sorry. Where is this guy? He's up in a hunting lodge about 30 miles from here. Miss Blair's drawn a map for you with all the directions. Okay. When do you want the job done? As soon as possible. Tomorrow? Fine. Oh, one thing. Yeah? It should appear to be an accident. A hunting accident. It will. Swell. Now, uh, here's the guy's picture, Russ. Uh, Don't make any mistakes. I never have. Here's your drink, boys. Oh, thank you, dear. Mr. Moody? Thanks. I have a toast. To what? To Russ. And a successful mission. The following evening at the local FBI field office, a sergeant of the state police is just introducing himself to Special Agent Jim Taylor. Uh, Mr. Taylor, I'm Sergeant Hall. Oh, hello there, Sergeant. How do you do? Uh, Your agent in charge sent me in to see you. Good. Sit down, won't you? Thanks. Well, Sergeant, what's on your mind? Well, my regular patrol includes a pretty remote section of mountain country about 30 miles north of here. Mm -hmm. There was a hunter found dead up there this morning. He'd been shot through the head. Oh, I see. Did you identify him? Yeah. Name's Conway. Hmm. Ralph Conway. He comes from a well-to-do family here in town. Sergeant, was this a hunting accident? I don't think so. Oh, why not? Well, there were several factors in the case that make me seem to think he was murdered. Well, let's hear them. Well, first of all, examination showed that Conway was killed with a forty-five caliber bullet. Uh-huh. I've never heard of anyone going hunting with a forty-five. <laughs> not unless they're hunting people. All right. What other factors have you? Well, we found a car abandoned not too far from the scene of the crime. It had Oregon plates on it. Our office wired to see if it had been stolen. Mm, I see. Sergeant, you find any trace of the weapon? No. How about footprints? It's a pretty dry country this time of year. Well, Sergeant, what would you like the FBI to do? I'd like some help on these. That's a shell I found near the body. Mm. And that's the bullet the coroner removed from Conway. I see. Well, I'll have them sent on to our laboratory in Washington and get a check against the National Unidentified Ammunition File. What's that? Well, that's a file of guns and ammunition found at the scenes of unsolved crimes. Now, they'll check the markings on this bullet with other 45 slugs they have on file and see if the same gun was ever used in any other crime. Well, how long do you think it'll be before you get a report? Well, I'm afraid that depends on how busy they are, Sergeant. However, I'll be in touch with you as soon as I hear from them. Uh, yes, Gwen? Any word from Russ? No. Gee, you, you, you'd think he'd call or something. He doesn't have to. Why not? He did his job. Very successfully, too. How do you know? I'm just reading the morning papers. They've all carried an account of a very tragic hunting accident. To Conway? Of course. Well, was he killed? Naturally. That's wonderful. You should read these papers when you get a chance. They gave the story quite a play. One of them even has an editorial warning all of its readers to be more careful when they go hunting. (laughs) No kidding. Hey, maybe we did some good with this. Darling, that was the whole idea, to help the community. (laughs) Well, what happens now? I think you should go to see Conway's lawyer. Okay. On your way, stop off at the bank. What for? Draw out $900. I want to give it to Russ. You promised him a thousand. I'm holding out 10% for my commission. How can you charge a commission? You remember I was very careful to tell him the job was for a client of mine. Oh, look. How cheap can you get? Darling, this is merely good business. Okay. What do I say to the lawyer? Just tell him you'd like him to make all the necessary arrangements for you to collect your husband's estate. I wonder how much it'll be. I'd say at least a quarter of a million. No kidding, Gee, being a widow is wonderful. Uh, 
busy, Mr. Taylor? Oh, no. No, come on in, Sergeant. I just got your message a little while ago. Have you heard from Washington? Yes, I received a report on that bullet. Wait, it's in this file here. Um... Oh, here it is. A bullet used to kill Ralph Conway matched two others in the unidentified ammunition file. Two others? That's right. In uh, October of 1946, there was a petty racketeer killed back east with the same gun. And in June of this year, the same gun was used to murder a bookmaker. Almost sounds like the owner is a professional. Yes. There's one thing that puzzles me, though. What's that? Well, the other two known murders that were committed with this gun were killings that involved other criminals. Yes. Now, you told me that Ralph Conway was from a well-to-do family. How does he fit in? I don't know. We checked on him. But he was never in anything that wasn't legitimate. But if we're correct in assuming that he was killed by a hired gunman, he had to be mixed up in something. That's true. Well, Sergeant, I think the first thing to do is go and talk to Conway's family. See if he had any enemies. Uh, would you mind doing that? Oh, no, not at all, Sergeant. I'll get over there right now. Oh, gee, it's good to be back here. Oh, hello, honey. Sure hot downtown. Was it hot in the lawyer's office? No, his place is air-conditioned. That's not what I meant. Hmm? I mean, how did you make out with him? Oh. Well, I don't think he likes me very much. Really? Why not? I was so charming. Nothing happened. You mean he didn't go for the widow routine? Oh, yeah. He admitted I was a legitimate widow. That's all I wanted to hear. Uh, Did you ask about the estate? Mm Mm-hmm. How much? Over $300,000. Such sweet music. Oh, that must be Russ. Let him in. Okay. Hello. Hello, Mr. Moody. Come on in. Thanks. Hello there, Russ. Hello, Walter. Allow me to congratulate you. That was a fine job you did. Thank you. Well, I suppose you've come here about your fee. That's right. Gwen. Yeah? Yeah. Did you bring back that cash? Yeah, I have it right here. Miss Blair cashed my client's check. As you know, he requested secrecy. I know. Here's the money, Walter. Thanks. Here you are, Russ. Your thousand less 10% commission from me, making 900 net. Okay. Well, I guess that closes the books, hmm? Uh, not quite. What do you mean? Let's uh, review a few of the facts. Well... When you first talked to me about the job, I thought I was going to knock off some stale nobody. So? And I pick up the papers and find I work on a guy named Ralph Conway who's worth a bundle. What's your point, Russ? I'm getting to that. I also find out that Miss Blair here is Mrs. Ralph Conway. Who told you that? It's in the afternoon papers. Mm. Russ, what difference does that make to you? I can figure as good as you can. She comes into a chunk of dough now as his widow. That's right. And you're going to get a piece of that dough for seeing to it that she became a widow. I still don't see why it matters to you. All right, I did the dirty work on this job. And according to the papers, you two figured to split up about 300000 And uh, where's the whiskey? Why? Well, you two were nice enough to drink a toast to my success when I left for the mountains. Let's drink another toast now. To our new partnership. We will return in just a moment to tonight's file from your FBI. Ed, I've just been talking to a professional worry lifter. You've been talking to a professional what? A professional worry lifter. And believe me, I can't think of anyone I'd rather have around in time of trouble. He's not the ordinary garden variety of worry lifter, the kind that's long on advice and short on action. He's a professional who really knows how to go to work and crack down on worries. I sure could use one right now. But where do you find him? Oh, that's easy. He's your equitable society representative. And believe me, when you're taking a beating from old man worry, when fears about your family's future are keeping you awake half the night, your equitable society's man is just what the doctor ordered. Ask him for a full and complete job of worry lifting, including readjustment income. Say that again, will you? Readjustment income. The Equitable Society's readjustment income plan provides extra income for the widow during the two toughest years. The two years immediately following her husband's death. Years in which she is adjusting the family way of life to a lowered income. You know, expenses can't be reduced overnight. It takes time. 
And that's why every life insurance program should provide readjustment income for extra help during the two toughest years. Sounds swell, Mr. Keating. But are there any strings attached to it? Does this readjustment income cost a lot of money? Why, it may not cost you a cent. It may require only a simple rearranging of your present life insurance program. In any event, the man to see is your professional worry lifter, your Equitable Society representative. Look in the phone book for the Equitable Life Assurance Society. That's E-Q-U-I-T-A-B-L-E. Or send a postcard care of this station to the Equitable Life Assurance Society of the United States. And now back to our FBI file, The Uninvited Partner. one characteristic of criminals which marks them as being different from the rest of their fellow citizens. And that is that their lives are motivated entirely by greed. The success of one plan, in this case the marriage of the nightclub singer to the young playboy, does not satisfy the criminal. His insatiable greed always drives him on to the next crime even if that next crime, as in tonight's case from the files of your FBI, is murder. Tonight's file continues in the FBI field office. Sergeant Hall of the state police is just approaching Special Agent Jim Taylor's desk. Hello, Sergeant. Hello, Jim. Did you contact Conway's family? I talked to his lawyer. Said he didn't know any enemies Conway might have had who'd want him murdered. I see. He did tell me something that might help us, though. Oh? What was that? Well, he discussed young Conway's secret marriage. Yes? It seems that the marriage was the result of a frame-up for her, so the lawyer said. Well, why didn't they have it annulled? Well, the Conway family hates publicity, and they were in the process of dickering with a girl to get her to agree to an annulment. And what was her reaction to that? Well, according to the lawyer, she seemed about to accept their offer of $10,000 when the murder occurred. Oh, I see. She gets the whole estate now, I guess. That's it. And she's already been to see him about it, too. I wouldn't say she was exactly in deep mourning, then. No. Well, who is she? Or who was she before she married Conway? A nightclub singer. She met Conway in one of the places she was working. Uh According to his lawyer, she got him quite drunk one night, drove him to a justice of the peace outside the city, and then married him. Did you find out where we can locate her? Yes. Yes, she lives in an apartment hotel. I checked over there before I came back to the office, and she'd left word at the desk that she wouldn't be back for about an hour. Uh, can I use your phone? Sure, Sergeant. I want to make a report on this to my office. Okay. I think I'll go over and talk to the widow. We'll meet back here. Gwen, any word from the lawyer? No. But while you were out, I had a visitor. Russ? No. This was a man named Taylor from the FBI. What did he want? Oh, he asked a million questions about Ralph. When we got married, how, who was there. What else? Wanted to know if I'd ever heard Ralph talk about any of his enemies. His enemies? Why'd he ask you that? He said that they knew that Ralph was murdered. And that it wasn't a hunting accident. That's not so good. What do you think went wrong? How do I know? I'm not working with the police. Well, I just thought you might have an idea. Look, don't make me such a big man. You were a full partner when things were going good. Have you heard from Russ? No, not a word. He said he'd get in touch with us when his money ran out. Must have had a couple of winners at the track. I hope he stays lucky. Maybe he won't bother us then. That's wishful thinking, honey. He'll be back here whether he goes broke or not. Walter. Hmm? Suppose he gets picked up by the cops for the killing. He might decide to talk. I know. That'd make everything just dandy. Wait. What? I just thought of something that might cover everything. What? Have you got any stationery in your desk? Yeah. I want you to write a letter. To who? To the FBI. To... Now get some stationery and write what I tell you. Oh, I'm sorry to have kept you waiting, Sarge, but I was in talking to the agent in charge about this case. Well, that's all right, Jim. Did you get to see Miss Conway? Mm-hmm, I did. Get anything from her? Well, that's what I was in talking to the agent in charge about. About what she told you? No, she didn't tell me a thing I didn't know before I went to see her. I don't understand, Jim. Well, after I interviewed her, I came back here to the office. Uh-huh. 
About an hour later, I got a note from her. What does it say? Well, when I was talking to her, I asked her whether or not she knew of any enemy Conway might have had who would go so far as to kill him. And she said no. That's correct. Now, in this note here, she says that she used to go with a hoodlum named Russ Moody before she married Ralph Conway. And she thinks that Moody may have killed Conway? That's it. She says that Moody was insanely jealous of anyone she even spoke to and that in some way he found out about her secret marriage to Conway. Who is Moody? Oh, we checked up on him. Got a bad record. Fortunately for us, he's wanted by the FBI now for unlawful flight to avoid prosecution. Are you going to pick him up? Yes, I'm having a warrant drawn up now for his arrest. Another one so that we can search his apartment, too. Mrs. Conway included his address in her note. Well, when do you want to go over there? Well, what time is it now, sir? Uh, 3.15. Well, those warrants ought to be ready by now. Let's pick them up and get going. Hello? Hello, Mrs. Conway. This is one of your partners. What do you want, Mr. Moody? Well, it's a long story. I went up to a horse room a little while ago, and I bet on three horses that were sure things. What's that got to do with me? They lost. That's too bad. Oh, it's worse than that. I lost a thousand more than I got. You shouldn't gamble. Look, I didn't call you for any lessons. Well, what did you call for? I want another thousand today. I gotta pay that bookmaker. Well, can't he wait? That's not his business. He plays for cash. I don't care how you do it, but dig me up a thousand by six o'clock. Where am I going to get a thousand dollars? Call Conway's lawyer. He'll go. I can't call him. Look, I just told you, I don't care where you get it. Are you calling me from your apartment? No, I'm in the horse room. You going home from there? No. I'm going to stay here until after the last race. Then I'm coming over to your place. I'll be there at six o'clock. Be sure you're home. And be sure you have that dough. Is that you, Jim? No. Yeah, I've got the keys. I showed the superintendent the search warrant and he handed them right over. Well, let's go in. All right. Yeah, it doesn't. Go ahead, Sergeant. Thanks. Well, we've got one break anyway. We've only got one room to search. Yes. Well, let's take a look in that dresser, huh? Okay. Let's see. Shirts. Socks. Wait a minute. This might be what we're looking for. What is it? Look, it's a forty-five. The same caliber gun that was used on Conway. I know. Sorry, let's take a look at that firing pin. Oh, off center, eh? Mm-hmm. You remember the peculiar markings on the shell you found near Conway's body? Mm-hmm. This could very easily be the gun that was used. Well, we'll send it along to the laboratory and let them check. They can tell us for sure. Well, let's look into the drawer. Give me the gun, Jim. I'll wrap it up. Okay, here you go. Anything in there? Mm, no. Well, let's see what's in there. Mr. Moody doesn't have many possessions. No. Hey, wait a minute. What? Something under these handkerchiefs, eh? Oh. Okay, Sarge. What is it? A hand-drawn map. Does it look familiar to you? Yes. That's the territory where Conway was shot. Mm-hmm. This ties Moody into it, all right. I think it does more than that, Sergeant. Let's get back to the office. Walter, where have you been? What's the matter, Brad? I got a phone call from our partner. Russ? Who else? Where was he? In a horse room. Did he say if he was going home? No, he's coming over here. Then your note to the FBI won't work. Yeah, I know. Did he say why he was coming here? Now, I'll give you just one guess. Money? Naturally. When did he say he'd be here? Six o'clock. Six now? Yeah. I called the FBI a few minutes ago. Told him Russ would be here. When did Russ call? Two hours ago. Why didn't you call the FBI then? Oh, I was too upset. I didn't think. Walter, if he gets here before the FBI does, what do we do? I'll handle that. Do you think we should... Answer it. Okay. Hello? Come in, Russ. Thanks. Well, all partners present, eh? That's right. I won't waste much of your time. Did you dig me that money? It's not here yet. Did you call the lawyer? Uh, Yes, she did. He's sending it over. Okay. 
Oh, uh, that must be the messenger now. Let him in, Gwen. Yeah, yeah, sure. Hello, Mrs. Conway. Oh, come in. Thank you. I received your message. That man there is Russ Moody. What is this? Say where you are, Moody. I have a gun. Who are you? I'm a special agent of the FBI. And I've got a warrant here for your arrest for the murder of Ralph Conway. Well, I'm sure glad you got here before he made any trouble. I'm grateful to you, too, Mrs. Conway. If it hadn't been for you, we might never have known about Moody. Why? We also might never have found the map you drew for Moody to get to your husband's hunting lodge. What? I found that in his room. The handwriting matched the note you sent me at the office. Walter. There must be some mistake. I'll give all of you a chance to correct it. I'm taking you in now for questioning. <laughs> Russ Moody was convicted in a state court for murder and sentenced to be executed. Walter Hughes was convicted as an accomplice to murder and sentenced to be executed. Gwen Blair, his female companion, was also convicted as an accomplice to murder and given life imprisonment. And thus, three more criminals saw their careers ended because of thorough investigative work by a special agent of your FBI. And the important thing about the arrests was that it removed from circulation a professional killer, a man who made his living by murder. His conviction also closed the files on a number of unsolved murders, thanks to the unidentified ammunition file, a little-known but very important section of the laboratory of your FBI. In just a moment, we will tell you about next week's exciting case from the files of your FBI. Say, Mr. Keating, just one last question about the Equitable Society Readjustment Income Plan you were telling us about. You said extra cash for the first two years after the husband's death. Does it have to be exactly two years, no more, no less? No, Ed, this equitable plan is completely elastic. Its purpose is to give your wife extra cash for as long a period as you think she'll need to adjust her expenses to a new standard of living. I see. Why not get the whole story from your Equitable Society representative? Let him show you how little it costs to provide your wife with equitable readjustment income. Call your Equitable representative soon. Or send a postcard care of this station to the Equitable Life Assurance Society of the United States. Next week, we will bring you another colorful story from the files of the Federal Bureau of Investigation. The Big Build-Up. The incidents used in tonight's Equitable Life Assurance Society's broadcast are adapted from the files of the Federal Bureau of Investigation. However, all names used are fictitious, and any similarity thereof to the names of persons living or dead is accidental. Tonight, the music was composed and conducted by Frederick Steiner. The author was Jerry Lewis... Your narrator was Dean Carlton, and Special Agent Taylor was played by Stacey Harris. This is your FBI is a Jerry Devine production. This is Larry Keating speaking for the Equitable Life Assurance Society of the United States and the Equitable Society's representative in your community, and inviting you to tune in again next week at this same time when the Equitable Life Assurance Society will bring you another thrilling story from the files of the Federal Bureau of Investigation. The big build-up on This Is Your FBI. This is ABC, the American Broadcasting Company. The Equitable Life Assurance Society presents This Is Your FBI. This Is Your FBI the official broadcast from the files of the Federal Bureau of Investigation, presented as a public service by the Equitable Life Assurance Society of the United States and the Equitable Society's representative in your community. By rail, by bus, by car, plane or ship, Americans are on the move. It's vacation time. Twelve million of these Americans are policyholders and beneficiaries who own or will benefit by equitable society life insurance policies. 
We like to think that these folks are enjoying extra peace of mind on their holidays thanks to the extra security they have gained through the Equitable Life Assurance Society. To make your own vacation carefree, take care to have all the life insurance protection you need. See your Equitable Society representative. Tonight's FBI file, The Big Build-Up. In many ways, the world of crime is an accurate reflection of the customs and the conditions of the country. For one thing, crime flourishes in economic times like the present, after a war when money is loose. But perhaps the way in which the criminal population has most completely mirrored our civilization is that this, for them, too, has become an age of specialization, a time when one man does one job well. Whatever his field of crime, be it arson, blackmail, or swindling, once he finds a formula that works, he does not deviate. That is true of almost every type of criminal, but is especially true of one specific type, the criminal known as the confidence man. Tonight's FBI file opens in a motor court on the outskirts of a large Midwestern city. There, in one of the cabins, confidence man George Thompson is present as his two partners, Mr. and Mrs. Jack Milford, engage in a family fight. George, trying to stop it, speaks. Oh, Gloria, why don't you just relax, honey? This isn't getting us any place. Oh, shut up. But I'm trying Look, to... you're not doing any better than he is. A uh, fine pair of con men. Oh, Gloria, lay off. We've been here five days now, and the only people we've met are bartenders. That's a lot. Sure, we've been at every meeting at that convention since it started. It was your idea to come to the convention, not mine. But you were with us when we heard that this loyal order of Lemrods was loaded with rich guys. I know. And we've been working on them, too. We even learned their secret handshake. Sure, and we got badges that say we're loyal sons of the Lemrod. What more do you want us to do? The convention ends in three days. I want to see some action. Look, we've dropped the wallet five times already. And every time we do, the sucker is either too rich or too honest to go for it. Yeah. Oh, don't con me. There aren't that many honest people in the whole world. Okay, okay, you know it all. You take over. That's just what I intend to do. Come on, let's all get dressed and go into town. I'll find a sucker tonight if it kills me. <laughs> Hey, Gloria, you want to dance? We didn't come here to dance. Oh, I thought we could chase the room better from the floor. I'm looking. If anybody alive comes in, I'll see him. Okay, okay. You run it the way you want. Thanks. Only do me one favor, huh? will you? Stop nagging all the time. Hey, what are you staring at? I don't run now, but I think I see our man. Where? The next table right behind you. It's okay now. Take a gander. Oh, yeah. How do you figure him? Well, for one thing, I saw him slip the head waiter a fin when he sat down. Oh, uh-huh. Saw him look at the wine card and order a bottle of high-class Fino. Oh. And he's wearing his badge from the Lemron. You better put yours on. Yeah, okay. Um, how do you think we ought to make them? You just leave that part to me. All right. But don't let this one get away. Good evening, Brother Lemron. Hey, hello, son. I can't quite read your name on that badge in this light, but my name is Milford. <laughs> Glad to meet you. Uh, my name's Sheldon. Uh, this is Mrs. Sheldon. Uh, how, how do you do? do? So nice to meet any of Wilbur's lodge mates. <laughs> <laughs> it's nice to meet you, too. Uh, oh, Gloria. Yeah? Come here, man, will you? And this is Mrs. Melford, Mr. and Mrs. Sheldon, dear. Um, how, how do you do? do? How are you? <laughs> this is Gloria's first convention, and mine, too. Oh, my, I stopped counting years ago. <laughs> <laughs> yes, Mother and I have been coming ever since the children grew up. Gives us something to do, you know. <laughs> well, we've certainly had a lot of fun all week. Oh, so have we. Say, I've got an idea. Huh? What's that, son? Why don't we move our tables together and make it one big happy party? <laughs> All right, now, hold it, everybody. Hold it. Uh, what is it? Uh, what for? Uh, the girl's going to take another picture of it. Oh. 
<laughs> now, everybody put on their paper hats. All right. Here you are, Mother. Put this on there. Uh, That's it. Okay, now. Hold it. <laughs> that did it. That Goodness, I've had my picture taken this many times in my whole life. <laughs> and you haven't been to this many nightclubs, Mother, either. No, I haven't. Oh, hey, look. Look at Jackie's under the table. Hey, what's the matter? Passed out there? Oh, oh, no, no. I didn't pass out. I just felt this with my foot. Oh, what is it? Uh, a wallet. Yeah. And look at this. It's loaded with cash. And who does it belong to? Oh, I don't know. Oh, what do I see here? Oh, here's a card. Uh, George Thompson. But it doesn't say where he lives? No. Hmm. Well, I guess the best thing to do is turn it over to the head waiter. Oh, yes, yes. yes. I think that'd be the honest thing. I uh, beg your pardon. Did you find that wallet here? Well, yes, I did. Oh, brother, believe me, I'm very grateful to you. Why, is it yours? Yes. Well, can you identify yourself? Oh, certainly. My name is George Thompson. Oh, right here, I've got my signature on my cigarette lighter. Uh, any signature in the wallet? Yes. I'll write my name here. This should be proof. There. How's that? Oh, it's okay. Here's your wallet, Mr. Thompson. Oh, thank you very much. And, uh, here. I'd, uh, like to give you a reward. Oh, no. I wish you'd take this cash. No, no, thanks. Maybe I'll be that lucky next time I lose something. <laughs> well, uh, do you mind if I do something for you? Oh, you mean like buying us a drink? No, no, I'd like to do more than that. Uh, look. I, uh, hear of a good horse every now and then. I'll tell you what I'm gonna do. Well, what's that? Well, I was going to give you $200 for returning my wallet, but uh, suppose I just bet it for you on a horse tomorrow and give you the profits. Oh, that's all right with me, except that all four of us should be partners on that bet. Uh, Okay, Mr. Shelton? Well, I... uh... I I speak for him, Mr. Milford. We think it's fine. (laughs) Good. Uh, Well, uh, where can I get in touch with you people? Well, uh, contact Mr. Sheldon. You folks are at the Central Hotel, aren't you? Yes, that's right. Well, that's fine. I think I'll be contacting you there tomorrow evening with your profits. Meanwhile, in that same city at the local FBI field office, Special Agent Adam Preston is just entering the office of his fellow agent, Jim Taylor. Jim, Mr. Weaver said I was going to work with you. Uh, What's it all about? Well, Adam, we just received a wanted circular from the Chicago office on three swindlers. Mm -hmm. Chicago thinks they're headed this way? Yes, their lead is that the trio was headed here by car. In fact, they should already be here in town now. What's the racket? Well, they've been pulling the old wallet gag and tying it up to another old horse racing swindle. How does that work? Well, the wallet gag is worked when one swindler finds a wallet full of money in front of the victim. The swindler's partner then steps up and claims the wallet. Mm-hmm. He offers a reward, which the swindler refuses. Then, in gratitude, he says he'll make a free bet for the swindler and the victim on a sure thing horse. And the horse loses. Oh, no, no, the horse wins. But instead of paying any money, the man with the wallet says he'll bet it back on another horse. I see. Now, that horse wins, too. Well, by now, the swindler and the victim theoretically have a profit of, oh, say, several thousand dollars. What happens then? Then the man with the wallet says he'll give them their profits, but... Before he does, they have to prove that they would have been able to pay that much had they lost. Mm -hmm, I see. And the victim draws his money out of the bank to prove that he could have paid. That's it. Whereupon, Swindler and his confederate take the victim's money and leave. And people fall for that kind of a swindle? (laughs) Yes, indeed they do, Adam. Hmm? What do you think ought to be our first step in this case, Jim? Well, let's start a check on every hotel and rooming house in the city. Maybe we can catch them before they build up another victim. Can I uh, fix you something to drink, Miss Milford? <laughs> no, thanks. Oh, why don't you try one of those sarsaparilla drinks? Oh, no, thank you. Jack should be here any minute. I just hope I'm not inconveniencing you hanging around like well, this. Well, of course not, child. He uh, said he was seeing that Mr. Thompson, didn't he? Yes, yes. He, he was going to collect our winnings. Uh, how much have we won all together now? Over $4,000. Oh, good oh, heavens. Uh, one... oh, answer the door, Father. Yes, dear. Hello, Mr. Sheldon. Well, hello, son. Come in. Come in, Miss Sheldon. Hello, dear. Hello, honey. Well, folks, we won again today. Good no. How much? Our total is now twelve thousand oh, dollars. Oh, but that, that, that's six thousand dollars a piece. That's right. But there's one small hit. Oh, mm-hmm. what is it, son? Well, Mr. Thompson won't give us the twelve thousand unless we show him twelve thousand of our own money. He says he wants to be sure that we could have paid this much if we had lost. Oh. And, and then he'll give us the money? Oh, yes. Well, that, that sounds fair and square to me. Yes, yes. but 
Where am I going to get 12000 to show him? I've only got about $6,000 myself. Oh, well, we can help you there, son. Oh? Why, well, after all, we're partners. Yes, uh, right. You put up 6000 and we'll put up the other six. Yes. Oh, swell. Uh, when does Mr. Thompson want to see this money? Well, he said he'd meet us here at the hotel tonight at 9. Uh, up here in this room? Yes. Well, you get your money and I'll go get ours. And we'll all meet back here. <laughs> Jim, I hope you had better luck than I did. Not much, Adam. I went to the clerk at every hotel and rooming house on my list, but none of them recognized any of the pictures. Yeah, same thing happened to me. I did pick up what might be a small lead, though. What's that? I had a hunch they might go to work on some of the people who were in town for the Lemrods convention. And did they? Apparently they did. I checked with the convention chairman, and he said that several members had told him they'd been approached with the old wallet gag. And none of them went for it? Fortunately, no. Chairman said he'd warn the other delegates at the next meeting. Well, that ought to stop them there. Mm-hmm. Then I went over to the city desk at each paper, gave them the story with pictures of the three swindlers. Are they going to print the pictures? Yes, with stories, too, warning the people about the racket. Well, I guess they'll have trouble pulling anything now. I'd still like to nail them, though, before they leave town. What do you think we ought to do? Oh, I received a teletype from the Chicago office just before you came in. About the swindlers? Yeah, it said they just learned the trio had lived in a motor court in one of the suburbs of Chicago. You think they're following the same pattern here? I don't know, Adam, but let's try and find out. Gloria. Huh? What is that? Before we get to Sheldon's room, let's check up on our routine. What is there to check? Have you got our 6,000? Uh huh. Right here in my purse. You know the procedure? Yeah. I flash our money first. Right. Well, here's their room. Um, hey, what, what time to tell George to get here? In 10 minutes. Oh. Good evening. Oh, hello, Mr. Sheldon. You come in, both of you. Thank you. Good evening. Thank yes. you, Mr. Sheldon. Hello, hello, Mr. Sheldon. Hello, how, how are you, Mr. Sheldon? Yeah, no sign of Mr. Thompson yet. Well, he's not due for another ten minutes. Uh, did you get your money? Yes, sir. Six thousand? Right. Uh, did you bring your money? Uh-huh. Oh, here it is. Oh, goodness, all those bills. Well, there's our half, folks. Could we see yours? Oh, oh, surely. Uh, show it to the mother. Very well, there you are. What? A gun? That's right. Hey, what is this? My dear boy, you didn't think we were going to fall for that old racetrack swindle, did you? Oh, huh? Mom's right. I'd advise you to get yourselves a new racket. Either that or pick your suckers more carefully. Jack, do something. Don't yeah. move, son. I can use this if I have to. Father, pick up their money. Yes, Mother. Yeah. Let me have it, my dear. No. Now, keep away. Dear girl, please remember this gun. Gloria, give him the dough. Oh. Okay. Thank you. Well, what happens now? We're just going to put you both in the closet and leave. What? But first, I have some advice for you. Well? For the sake of our profession, please go into some legitimate work. <laughs> We will return in just a moment to tonight's case from the files of your FBI. Tom, how would you like to meet a professional worry lifter? Professional worry lifter? Well, that's a new one on me. Well, a professional worry lifter is a man whose business it is to make other people's worries vanish. For instance, an amateur worry lifter may give you plenty of sympathy and nothing else. A professional worry lifter really does something about it. Actually worked hard to make your worries disappear. Say, he must be a popular man. He's your equitable society representative. And if you are haunted by thoughts of what might happen to your family if you were no longer there to take care of them, let me suggest that you see an equitable man right away. You'll find he doesn't miss a single trick. His plan will include everything, even readjustment income. Readjustment income? What's that? The Equitable Society's readjustment income plan provides extra income for the widow during the two toughest years, the two years immediately following her husband's death, years in which she is adjusting the family way of life to a lowered income. You know, expenses can't be reduced overnight. It takes time. And that's why every life insurance program should provide readjustment income for extra help during the two toughest years. Sounds like a mighty good idea. Does it cost an awful lot? Why, it may not cost you a cent. It may require only a simple rearranging of your present life insurance program. In any event, the man to see is your professional worry lifter, your equitable society representative. 
Look in the phone book for the Equitable Life Assurance Society. That's E-Q-U-I-T-A-B-L-E. Or send a postcard care of this station to the Equitable Life Assurance Society of the United States. And now back to the FBI file, The Big Build-Up. Statistics are available on almost every field of crime. You can learn how many murders there were in any period, or the number of armed robberies, or the value of every stolen automobile. But in one field of crime, the figures are inaccurate, and that field is swindling. The figures are inaccurate here because in many cases, the victims prefer to take his loss and not admit that he has been duped. It is safe to say, however that the American public every year is swindled out of millions and millions of dollars. That was true last year, and it'll be true this year. There's one way, and only one way, in which you can protect yourself. In doing business with strangers, don't expect to get something for nothing. Tonight's FBI file continues in the hotel room of the Sheldons. Gloria and Jack Milford are still locked in the closet... Well, Jack is trying to break down the door. <laughs> they must have built this closet as an air raid shelter. This is a good time for jokes. Well, I'm tired. I've been banging away at that door now for ten minutes. What do you want? Sympathy? No, no. Just be your usual charming self. Hmm. If you think it's so easy, take a crack at it yourself. Uh, not me. You got us in here. I did. Who picked out the sucker? Remember? Well, if you hadn't been so stupid, you'd have recognized them. Oh, get back. I'm going to try this again. <laughs> Oh, then I can reach out and unlock the door. There. Come on. Hey, they're gone. Naturally. Did you think they'd wait for us? Oh, shut up. But where do you think they went? How do I know? They didn't tell me. Oh, that must be George. I'll get it. Okay. Come in, come in. Uh, what's been going on in We here? got stuck up. Stuck up? Who did it? Our two suckers. Huh? We asked to see their dough, and they asked to see ours first. When Gloria flashed it, the old lady came out with a Betsy. Oh, that's great. Well, there's only one thing to do. Let's try to find him and get our dough back. Okay, well, let's split up. I'll see what I can find out here at the hotel, and I'll meet you at the Crystal Bar in an hour. Mother? Yes, dear? What's that you're working on? Some embroidery. It's a pillow. Pillow? With writing on it? Of course, it's a souvenir pillow. Giving it to Cousin Kathy for a wedding present. Oh. Uh, what's it say on the pillow? The motto. Honesty is the best policy. Ah, that's very nice. Mm-hmm. What time is this train due in Cleveland, Father? I, uh, about an hour now. What kind of a convention are we attending? Undertakers. Well, that sounds very enjoyable. Never contacted undertakers before. I know, Mother. Change will do us good. <laughs> huh? <laughs> What's the joke? I'm just thinking about those youngsters and their racetrack swindle. <laughs> <laughs> yes, they were very, very cruel. I know. But, Father, they do make it hard for the rest of us. The way they work, they'd make anyone suspicious. Yeah, they make people honest, too. Oh, heavens, don't say that. People are getting more honest right along as it is. <laughs> no, no, Mother. Don't start talking yourself into one of those moods. Just remember this. If there's someone dishonest around, we'll find them. Where have you been, Jim? Looking at tourist cabins. I located the place where our swindling trio was staying. Was staying? Yeah, they checked out several hours ago. I searched the cabin, though. Did you find anything? Yes, this picture here. It's taken at the 907 Club. Hmm. That's Milford and his wife, all right. And I also know that old couple that's with him. You do? Who are they? Well, that's what I've been trying to think of. I came back here to check their picture against the files. I have a strong hunch they're wanted, too. Are they also swindlers? I think so, Adam, mm-hmm. yes. You think they might have all been working together? No, that's pretty hard to tell. 
Did you get any lead on where the gang had gone? Well, the manager of the outer court said that Milford made a phone call from his office. Did he know who he called? Yes, it was the central hotel, but he wasn't sure who he talked to at the hotel. No idea at all. Well, he didn't remember for sure. He said it might have been Shelburne. She... Wait, I remember now who that old couple is. That's Mom and Pop Sheldon. Then they must be the ones at the central hotel. That's right. Let's get over there right now. <laughs> Look, if Jack doesn't show up All here in a it, few minutes... Here he comes now. Well, I didn't get much, but I got something. Yeah, what's that? Uh-huh. Well, nobody at the hotel knew where the Sheldons went, but I picked up some information from the bartender here. Uh-huh. Well, don't keep it a secret. We got taken by two of the slickest con merchants in the business. Huh? Mom and Pop Sheldon. Oh, yeah, I've heard of them. I give the bell captain at the hotel a double saw, and I got to call him later to see if they come back for their bags. Well, what do they want with their bags? They got our six Gs. Hey, isn't the bartender waving to you? Yeah, I'll, I'll be right back. Yeah. The Sheldons, huh? Well, honey, you really picked a couple of daisies when you took over. Oh, let's not go into that again. Uh, you weren't satisfied to let me and Jack run things. Well, what do you want me to do, kill myself? All right, so we got outsmarted. Next time we'll know better. Yeah, there might not be a next time unless we get our six Gs back. I think I got it. I got what? I told the bartender there was 50 in it for him if he could find out where the Sheldons went. Yeah, did he know? No, but they were in here drinking last night, and the other bartender served them. Oh, when did they come to work? Well, we don't have to wait. This guy called him at home. Oh. And he remembered hearing them say that their next stop was Cleveland. Well, what are we waiting for? <laughs> Adam, over here. Jim. Hmm? Sheldon's have skipped without paying the hotel bill. Well. Did you find anything in the room? Not a thing except the smash closet door. You think there was a fight? No, hardly. The Sheldon's are too old to fight. My guess is they locked someone in that closet and then left. Could it have been the Milfords? Could have been. The elevator boy remembers taking them up there. He identified them from the pictures I showed him. It sounds like everybody was double-crossing everybody else. Oh, why? Well, the desk clerk looked at the pictures and said that Milford was here looking for the Sheldon. Trying to find out where they went? Yes. Well, that is right. Mm-hmm. But I think there's one thing we can be sure of, Adam. What's that? If we can find the Sheldons, we've got a good chance to grab all of them. Yes, but there's not a single lead on where the Sheldons went when they left here. Oh, there's only one. What's that? The bell captain told me that during the week, old man Sheldon sent him out to buy a book on embalming. On embalming? Yeah. Well, what would he want that for? From their record, the Sheldons don't get mixed up in any murders. I know. Their record shows that they... Hey, wait a minute. I've got a hunch. Let's get to that out-of-town newspaper stand. I think we might find out where the Sheldons have gone. Mother, pass me the butter, please. Surely. Here you are. Thank you, dear. This is a wonderful idea, having dinner served in the room. Yes, gives us a chance to rest. You know, every time I walk into a hotel dining room, it's like work. Always looking for a prospect. (laughs) (laughs) Me too. (laughs) This ought to be a wonderful convention. Yes. There are a lot of rich undertakers. Mm -hmm. Is some more coffee, dear? No, thank you. When I get a good night's sleep. (laughs) Convention opens at nine tomorrow morning, you know. Yes, I do. I must be the waiter coming back to the table. Yeah, are you all finished, dear? Yes, let him in. All right. Hello, Mr. Sheldon. What? Mr. Milford. That's right. Back up and let us in. Father? What? Who's that? It's us, Mrs. Sheldon. Oh. George, keep that gun on him. Right. Now, don't move either one of you. We've got the gun this time. Now, right now, where's the dough? We haven't got it. We, we put it in the bank. You're lying. We, look, we've never killed anybody before, but we wouldn't mind starting on you. So get it up. Yeah. All righty. It's in that wallet. Inside pocket of my coat. Oh, Father. There's one on that chair. Get it, Gloria. Okay. It better be all there, too. It is. So you took us for chumps, huh? You were very clumsy. Is it all there, Gloria? Yeah. Looks like more than we gave him. Oh, that's fine. Who's that? That's the man from room service for the table. Okay. George, open the door and let him in. All right. But remember, you two, don't get out of line. That gun kills waiters, too. Drop that gun, Thompson. Huh? Go and drop it. <laughs> Adam, see if any of the others have guns on them. Right. Well, who are you? Special agents of the FBI. Goodness. Now, you're all coming along with us. All 
five swindlers were tried and convicted for violating the National Stolen Property Act and sentenced to long prison terms in a federal penitentiary. And thus, five criminals engaged in confidence games were removed to a place where they will not be able to swindle anyone for quite a while. Now, this case in the files of your FBI was closed because a special agent, hearing that a confidence man had bought a book on embalming, remembered that the confidence man always worked conventions. A study of out-of-town newspapers showed that there was to be a convention of undertakers in nearby Cleveland. Putting those two pieces of information together closed the case and once more protected you, the American people, from a criminal enemy. In just a moment, we will tell you about next week's exciting case from the files of your FBI. Mr. Keating... I've been thinking about that Equitable Society Readjustment Income Plan. And the more I think, the better I like the idea of fixing it so my wife would have extra income during those first two years. That's right, Tom. That extra cash every month for two years would give her time to adjust her expenses to a new standard of living. Okay, I'm sold. Then let me suggest that you get in touch with your Equitable Society representative without delay. Let him show you how little it costs to provide your wife with Equitable Readjustment Income. Call your equitable representative soon. Or send a postcard care of this station to the Equitable Life Assurance Society of the United States. Next week, we will bring you another colorful story from the files of the Federal Bureau of Investigation, The Ambitious Widow. The incidents used in tonight's Equitable Life Assurance Society's broadcast are adapted from the files of the Federal Bureau of Investigation. However, all names used are fictitious, and any similarity thereof to the names of persons living or dead is accidental. Tonight, the music was composed and conducted by Frederick Steiner. The author was Jerry Lewis, your narrator was Dean Carlton, and Special Agent Taylor was played by Stacey Harris. This is your FBI is a Jerry Devine production. This is Larry Keating speaking for the Equitable Life Assurance Society of the United States and the Equitable Society's representative in your community. And inviting you to tune in again next week at this same time when the Equitable Life Assurance Society will bring you another thrilling story from the files of the Federal Bureau of Investigation. The Ambitious Widow on This Is Your FBI. This is ABC, the American Broadcasting Company.